Ladies and gentlemen, my name is John Kennel from the film consulting and promoting initiative Felix Motor Society. Now, let's start the show. This is Anthony Alex from the Angry Mailman podcast, and you're listening to another fine show from the From Page to Screen Media Empire. Hey guys, this is Ace Marrero from the movie Madison County. Hi, this is David L.G. Hughes, writer-director of the film Hall Bowl Suites. I love the pace and the fastness, and I love the fact that you just roll with it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contracted. Hi, I'm Derek Amaru, the writer-director of The Asian. My name is Nathan Whitehead, and I wrote the music for Beyond Skyline. Hello, Stuart. Just a quick hello from Sarah Douglas. Hi, this is Ben Lloyd Holmes from the film The Expedition. This is Dominic Burns, the director of Allies. Hey, Stuart. Page the screen. Dot com up in my bum leaves. Snake, get up to my motorcycle running and tracking over the motherfucking snakes, genius. With Dom, eating pizza and pussy. I'm Neil Johnson, I directed Rogue Warrior and The Time War, and I crucified Adolf Hitler. The From, from Page to Screen to screen. Hi, Stuart. How are you doing, Mark? You all right? I'm good, thank you. Well, I just need to, I think I need to get my speaker on, do I? Uh, well, I can hear everything you're saying, so if you're all right with that, I'm okay with that too. Hopefully you're uh, hopefully you're still here. Otherwise, that would be the shortest podcast in the history of podcasts I've ever done. Stuart, there you go, and you're back. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right, good. I thought <laughs> me and technology. I, th- I thought I'm not that bad. He only said hello, and he's liked it. What? <laughs> yeah, no, it's me and technology. I, I'm, a, I'm of a certain age where it refuses to work for me. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I think the reality is technology refuses to work for everybody, I think. So it's not it's not picking on you because of whatever year you were born. So oh, my God. <laughs> just just to pop that bubble. Technology is a pain in the butt sometimes. So how how are you this I would say fine Sunday afternoon, but we had a thunderstorm up here, so the weather's not so great. Right, no, we've got rain here as well, but uh, no I'm well, thank you. Good. Well I, th- I think winter's on its way now. It's I think we're done. I think we've had summer. Gone. Yes, I know, and unfortunately, I was rehearsing inside yesterday when, on what looked like our last day of summer this year. But hey, there we go. So you missed it. If you go on social media, though, I think some people will have taken pictures of the sun, so you can <laughs> actually have a look at them. So, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, all yeah, right. Yeah. How did rehearsals go? Yeah, going well. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm really sort of locking in now, and yeah, I'm walking around with the script in my hand on a daily basis. It's my, uh, it's my, it's my new companion. So if you start reading out random lines that make no sense to the question or whatever I've just said, then I know what it is. You've just dipped back into the script. Absolutely. <laughs> and believe me, that's happening, actually, Stuart. Really? Wow. So it yep. wasn't, you yep. weren't really doing rehearsals yesterday. The, it wasn't sunny yesterday. This, is, this could be a very confusing one, this, couldn't it? <laughs> so I was reading uh, like a couple of articles that probably written years ago. And one of the funniest ones, which I only read about 10 minutes ago and it's still making me chuckle, is somebody said, are there any aspects of Norman Stebson that you find you have? And you said, he kind of looks like me and we've got the same hairstyle, which is perfect. Well, yeah. <laughs> love it. like, what did they expect you to say? I beat children up and actually I steal lunch money and terrorize people. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it still made me chuckle. It's a very good spot on answer. So, <laughs> I was uh, I was watching earlier the very first three episodes of Grange Hill downstairs because wow. somebody years ago this is back in the day when Internet Movie Database had the chat board so you, people would go on and just complain about everything as they generally do and somebody on there went I've got twenty nine seasons of Grange Hill so I messaged this guy and I'm like how can I get them because I've missed these were never out on DVD at the time. I went, how can I get them? And I think I paid like 30 quid and he sent me a stupid pile of DVDs all taken off the TV. So I've got 20, I've probably got every single episode that you were in. So at some point I will catch up with those again. Well, okay, thank you. I believe I know that um, uh, there was a re-release of DVDs last November. There was. I think they're up to like season six or something, you know, some of the early seasons. I, I just thought, bring a box set out. Bring all, all 30 years out or whatever. I, Bring them out. Oh, I see. Yeah, I know that last year there was a box set of. I, I know that there's a box set coming out in in um, November. I think it's of of uh, season seven and eight. Nice. 
How weird is that, though? Because you think, you know, you, you were in these years ago. I was there, you know, similar age. I think I was born in 1971, so you may be only a couple of years difference or whatever to me. So it yeah. must be strange for you that seeing DVDs come out from performances you did when you were in your, your teens or whatever, or does it not phase you? Um, uh, it's not, I mean, it's nice. It's amazing. I mean, that's work for, wow, that work is knocking on nearly 40 years old. It? It's like, yep. yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, I'm, you know, yeah. Um, I, I think it was sort of 79 to 83 I worked on that. And then there was a few, uh, I think, you know, 84, 85, the character had small little sort of cameos. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of over 35 years ago anyway, isn't it? And still one of the most iconic characters in the show. You know, obviously you've got Roland and Zamo and then Gripper. They're, they're the three main ones that people talk about all these decades after it's kind of cool when when i when grange hill first started back in 1978 i was still going to a comprehensive school and the sort of the dream of being a professional actor was still just a long long way away for me so uh you know i I was going to a comprehensive school when when grange hill started you know i never never had a dream that i'd ever get a part in it um, but it was very real. It was great from the start. It was, you know, I remember we could identify with it. Um, Phil Redmond had a very clever idea of the camera angles were always from the student, like the children's point of view. They were. I never, I never thought about that when I was watching it this morning. But you're, you're spot on. They were always look. You'd look up at the teachers and yeah. Yeah, so we're getting the the, uh, the point of view of of the the students and whatever. So it's. Uh, in fact, I guess it was rather groundbreaking at the time because it was the first time that maybe children were given a voice. I think also because it was it wasn't just a light-hearted show, was it? I mean, it had its light-hearted moments, but it also had its proper serious dramatic. I can watch that show now, and I'm in the 1978 uh, episodes at the minute, and it's a case of yep, oh, I remember those desks, I remember the ink wells, I remember this, I remember I remember teachers being able. To, you know, pick you up by the ear and give you a clout round the head and all this sort of stuff. So it's, right. f- Phil did nail it and definitely what school was like. And it's bizarre showing it to somebody who, like my partner, Annette, she's got teenage daughters and, and, and we've sat down and we've watched the first few episodes of Grange Hill in the past and they're, they're looking at it going, ah, school wasn't like that, was it? And you're like, yep. Really? The teachers could do that? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's it's okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Of course, I, 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 I know fair play. I mean, it's great. I don't, uh, long time I hadn't seen it, and, and I think I only ever seen it once, and that was the uh, the reruns in nine, in the early nineties. Uh, so I sort of tried to have a bit of an objective look there, but no, it's great. I mean, it's well, people are still watching, it. and generations who it must be strange for the younger generations to look, and wow, we don't. There was no mobile phones. No, no mobile phones. C- computers aren't even a thing in the ones I'm watching at the minute. You know, no, kids, no, no. kids walk to school on their own. It's like, what is this this Stone Age? <laughs> <laughs> it was bizarre, but it's, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying revisiting that. So It was kind of weird. You sent me a message earlier saying you were a little bit nervous about being on a podcast. Have you done podcasts before? No, oh. do you know, I, I think this is this is the uh, my, my first one. You're I'm breaking my podcast virginity with you, Stuart. Well, I'm glad to be the one taking your podcast virginity. <laughs> and that couldn't yeah. be done by a nicer fella. <laughs> I'll be gentle, I promise, it's fine. So, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, you sort of said you're a little bit nervous. And then you mentioned, because it's easier being a character than it is being yourself sometimes. I can relate to that as well to a certain extent. But has that always been the case for you? Do you, do you find it easier... Um, like breathing life into a character. Um, yeah, it's where it, it's it's how I've I found my voice. Funny enough, actually, so, you know, when uh, we were chatting and and, and um, you kindly asked me to come on and whatever, you know, you sort of just start sort of thinking. It. I actually passed the other day. I was a very shy child, very shy. Um, I yeah, just didn't really sort of communicate verbally. Um, I read a lot and whatever else. Then when I was about. Ten, I was at junior school, and there was um, a talent contest. And so uh, my mum helped me. We picked a poem, and it was called One of the Boys. I had listened to it last night. There's, there's a version of it on YouTube, and he, he's not that different to the character Gripper, funnily enough. 
we, we, we won the, the talent contest at school, and it was just all of my peers at school, all, all my classmates, and it was, wow, look, whoa, whoa, the, the, the shy kid has got a voice. Yeah. I was very shy, and, and all of a sudden, by reciting this po- uh, poem, um, yeah, I, I guess I was, able, I was able to articulate myself through the different medium, and for me, it's sort of through the medium of, of, um, of acting. Now, is that something that you see a lot still nowadays? Because you've got your own theatre company, which we're going to cover quite a bit in this conversation. Is that something that you do see in people who are involved in your theatre productions? You know, certainly the younger ones. Um, what are you... Uh, just, the sort, what, just, just the sort of, you know, they'll be, they'll be quite shy or maybe a little bit quiet. And then when you give them a script or you start to get them invested in a character then bang the the light goes on and they, they shine oh different i mean i think that just works across the board anyway i mean since i've been doing human issue with with i well, know we'll get them but human issue it's like it's, it's frank he's a stand-up comedian so he finds his voice through performing and and as the you know he goes on he he finds it rather cathartic um and then someone sent me a link to something called guest out therapy which is basically sort of a drama therapy. And it's also, when you look at it, it's something that's sort of, you know, if you go back to tribes and whatever else, it, it, it's something that's kind of been, been used in it. it so, I, yeah, I'm an advocate for drama, I think. Just the, watching drama, being involved in drama, in, in any way, just, just spiritually, I suppose. It makes us connect, and then it, for me, to, to be able to do different characters, I get a, a different perspective. It's really interesting to be able to play a character that you do not like, and so you've got, as an actor, you've got, you've got to find something. You've got to find some common ground with that actor to at least play them honestly. You may yeah. not like what they're doing, but you've got to find I, I guess it's about finding truth. I think it is. I mean, I've, I've spoken to a few people. I know quite a lot of people in the acting world who will play monstrous characters, and you, you sort of think, well, you've got to be able to like that character because nobody chooses to be a horrible, you know, evil person without realizing it. So if you're playing, you know, be it a Hitler or, yeah. or a serial killer or something, you've got to convince yourself, well, what I'm doing is right. Well, I have no problem with it. If other people don't like it, that's tough. Is, is that what you mean? No, actually, I'll tell you what I think it is. It's, it's completely and utterly, it's down to the writing. Without, without a script, I'm bumbling and I'm a minarian and whatever else. And once I can learn the lines, I can say them perfectly. That's fine. I mean, you know, I would have preferred a script for this, Stuart. It would have been better. <laughs> there are no scripts. No, no scripts at all. This is, it's, it, some people have classed them as interviews. I never do because I don't really know what I'm going to say until it comes out. I have a few things in my head that, that I'll ask you and stuff. But I think pre-prepared it takes away a lot of the natural feeling to it. And, and obviously, I, I don't know what your answer is going to be to a question, so how can I possibly think of the next question after the first one I've asked? Well, that's a, yeah, now you're comfortable with a fella to talk to, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're a comfortable person to uh, to speak with as well. So it's, uh, I used to live down south a few years ago, and I think one of the regrets that I never got was I never got a chance to meet up with you for a coffee because we did speak about it at one point, and I was down closer to London than I am now. So, you know, one day, one day we will grab the coffee. Definitely. Yes, of course, definitely. I, I, you, I think you was much further up the other end of the country at one stage, wasn't you? Yeah, well, I'm just north of Manchester now. But right. um, a couple of years ago, maybe just a little bit over that, I was living in Northampton. Right, so, right. And I used to periodically get into London for various bits and pieces, but we had to move back up north, unfortunately. So, you know, But we still have transport, so I will be down in London at some point. Excellent. No, yeah, no, we'll be good. Catch up. So, like you, you mentioned good writing and good writers. Let's talk Dean Moynihan. Yes, yes. Let's talk human issues. So, have you performed this play before, haven't you? Ro- yes. Yep. We, um, which I guess previewed in March and April. So, we did two uh, Sunday and Monday slots at the Hope Theatre in Islington. Yeah. Um, Matthew Parker and um, Luke Adamson um, were there. And uh, so we did that on a Monday, a uh, Sunday and a Monday uh, over two weeks. Um, but that, yeah, went really well. Whatever. And then in the uh, September, we did uh, one, uh, two performances, one in the afternoon, one in the evening at the Etc. Theatre in Camden. 
Now, which which um, shows generally easier? If you're doing two in a day, do you find the first one easier or the second one, or does, is it just hit and miss? Um, hit and miss? No, it's always perfection. Oh no, it. no. By that I mean you know one one oh, week, one week it'll be yeah. easier doing the first one. Next week it'll be the second one. I, I personally think would maybe the first one might be easier, but then again you might have done a few things in the first one where you go, I'm going to do that the second one. I you know. This is me no, yeah, Absolutely. Do you know that's the beauty about sort of performing live is that's just it's kind of in the you can prepare and whatever else, but the final performance, it, in a, I sort of equate it to sort of st- stepping out of a uh, an aeroplane and you're skydiving and just hoping that your parachute opens. <laughs> Yep. Thankfully, you know, your parachute always seems to be open. You're so that's into your performance and you're floating around and then you're starting to enjoy it. it, it you know, it's beautiful. And, it's, uh, and just having that connection with the audience as well. You know, to be in that space and for everybody to sort of, you know, be, sort of have that, that connection. And it, there is something magical about sitting in the audience at a theatre. It's not something I've done as much as I know I should have. And I think in the past few years i've been to theater only three times i know it's bad but previous to that i hadn't been and you know i'd seen uh, scott williams in hope we in liverpool which was amazing love that i've well, seen uh bruce willis before misery in new york which was just kind of weird because you're like bruce willis is like over there that's kind of strange and yeah. uh, we saw agatha christie's mousetrap and one thing cool. I always love is just I will look at the audience a lot because they're just transfixed. They're generally not taking the phones out every five minutes. They're not faffing around like they do at the cinema. They, they're yeah. all engaged, which I love that. I wish the cinema would be more like that. But there's something magical about looking at a theatrical audience, watching the stage, watching everybody. Yeah, it's sort of meditative in a sense. It's, 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 yeah, we're not distracted by our devices that is part of our everyday life now. We get the, distracted by them. And I think you also know that when you're watching a performance on stage, you could go away, come back and watch the show in the evening and it will not be 100% the same. There will be some little unique details that are just specific to you sitting in that room watching it at that time. I love that about it as well. You know, you watch a film, I go watch it again tomorrow. It's the same film, isn't it? Because it's, it's captured. But yes, th- yeah. theatre yeah, exactly. very different. It's I love the atmosphere. It's there, it's done, and it's, yes, something new, a bit like life, where it's about flux, isn't it? I know. You need to go to work. Yeah, it's a different day the day after. Mm. So you had you'd done a lot of TV in the 80s. So I started yep. off with a gentle touch, which was like a trip down memory lane. I'm like, I used to love that show. That was great. That was your first, I believe, on-screen appearance in an episode of that. Yeah, I read your generous blog. Thank you. And that was a reminder, actually. Well, I know. It's like, wow, it's decades, isn't it? It is. 1980. Wait, that was when it was released. So maybe it was 79 when it was shot. But Yeah, 79 I would, I would have started, yeah, started working professionally, yeah. But then you seem to take a gap at the end of the late 80s, and you didn't come back until you did Happy Rabbit in, uh, in 2009. What was it about Happy Rabbit that brought you back? No, I did um, 1995, I think it was. I did. Um, I was asked by Morrissey to be in his video, Dagenham Dave. You were as Dagenham Dave. That is not on your IMDb, yeah. so I need to slap them. They should have music videos yeah. on there. But no, I, that was how, how cool and strange was that? That was that was amazing. That, that was with lovely Jenny J. I'd worked with Jenny before on uh, a program, Miracles Take Longer. That was in the early eighties, and we did Dodger Bonzo and the rest. We had a featured part in that. And Drama Rama. I, I saw that title, Matt. Oh God, I used to love that program. It's, it was a trip down my youth, looking at a lot of the earlier work that you'd done. Some great stuff. Yeah. So, but then you know, Happy Rabbit. You know that was that was a short film that you yep. did. Where, yep. how, how did that one come about? With working with, with, oh, with uh, Carrie Ann? Uh, I think it was just something that my would have, an agent put me up for and, and went up for that. Mm-hmm. I think it's short films. You've you've done quite a few short films, and I think the one thing that annoys me about short films is sometimes they're really hard to find nowadays. <laughs> it's like where are they? I think there's, there should be a place where all these short films live, so we can all go to watch them, like a a short film Netflix or something like that. I think. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah, mm. there's, yeah. No, short films are great. It's for everybody involved. I think um, you know, really, it, it's amazing to get such a great story out there in a short space of time. I think it's more difficult as well. I think from 
you know, to make a short film. I would love to, because I'm in the process of putting my own short films together, and I find the one thing that's that I struggle with is like just the lack of time. I mean, I'm not dictated by whatever length of you know running time I've got. I can pretty much do whatever I want. But I see a lot of people who who've done short films at like seven, eight, nine minutes, and you watch them and you go, "I've just seen a complete story there. How the hell did you manage to put that in nine minutes? It's impressive." Yes. So yeah. It's good stuff. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm just about to start editing my own stuff, which is it's going to be a headache, but I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. When do you uh, intend on, on releasing them? Uh, I think time-wise, it will be very early next year. I think the first one's already shot, but then I, I started editing it on the computer I've got, and the computer went, mm, "I could probably edit this for you, but I may blow up because I'm not powerful enough." So maybe you want to upgrade your video card. I'm like, uh, yeah, I might. So I'm in the process of doing that at the minute, and then I will be back into editing, and I'll probably edit all over Christmas, and then put them out next year and and see. But it's. I, I much prefer publicising other people's work. It's easier for me because I, I watch something that you've spent years on and then I spend like a couple of hours watching it and I do do a bit of writing, a bit of talking about it and it's done. It's easy. But making it <laughs> takes a lot longer and it's expensive. So I, I don't know if I'm a fan. <laughs> but it's good. So let me, I want to chat about the Savage Theatre Company. Because you went to drama school before you were on screen in your Grange Hills and your gentle touches and stuff. So where did the idea for I'm going to start up my own theatrical company come from and when did it pop up? Um, I think it's something that every actor probably thinks about and certainly just the way that uh, things are now. That's, I think, the way forward to create your own work. Um, so yeah, it was creating my own work. I like reading scripts. I really love new writing. Um, you know, the, the theatre to me should, it, it is live and it should be new and whatever. Um, and so I just really, after after being around for so long, I guess I came to the realization that I've got I, I picked up quite a bit of knowledge. So I sort of challenged myself, I guess, to um, yeah, just, just sort of self self produce something. So the first thing I did is uh, is human issue. It was what was the biggest difficulty about that? Producing your own work for the first time. Uh, I think I think I've been pretty fortunate, really, uh, because it's it is very small. So uh, I love the script, Human Issue. Um, it's fantastic, um, really well well written. Um, I've worked on a lot of stuff as well, and it's just I. I I sort of asked Dean, would he direct it? Because I think the writer probably has the best kind of idea. And so we, and Dean also trained as an actor. Right. So I, you know, so, it, you know, the dynamic, how we're working is, is we're really, you know, yeah, we're really sort of really creating this character, Frank. He's, he's, he's really rounded now. He's great. And does it take a little, how long does it take to, to have Frank inhabit you? Or is it the other way around? But you know what I mean? To, to sort of go, right, nailed it. I've now I've got Frank. I know him, and inside now, he's perfect. Uh, yeah, it's uh, well. Frank's sort of like an everyman, so Frank is always going to be kind of changing as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I've got, got I've more or less got him now. Yeah, I've got another you know sort of two weeks. So yeah, it's going to be fun now. Really, really getting to know him and whatever. And yeah, so you know, next next Sunday is Frank Day. But no, so, Sunday is Sunday the sixth, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So has Frank changed since March, since you first did these these previous performances as a, as a person? Has he has he grown with you? He's he, um, he's grown actually with just uh, the way that I guess things are. It's it's um, since we've done it, it, it's just you know statistics from the Samaritans have, have come out with um, men of of Frank's age. Uh, are dying by suicide. It's one of the most common forms of death. Um, and so Frank kind of, in that sense, he fits in around that. I don't, I don't, it's not morbid or nothing. It's just the way the trends, the trends sort of are. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a morbid thing. It's, it, it is what it is, isn't it? It's a fact. So it's, but how, how do you, 
I don't know. Do you tackle a role like that very differently than you would say, you know, like your role in Dangerous Mind of a Hooligan or something? Is how do you adapt to? Because this is a more serious role, isn't it? Playing Frank. This is this is not just a theatrical performance of a guy called Frank. This is Frank who is dealing with something that real people, some of which who may be sitting in the audience watching the, the play, are dealing with. So how do you cope with that extra? I don't know whether they want to use the word responsibility, but you know what I mean, though. No. It's, it's, You're absolutely it's, right. It's a serious thing, a, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a responsibility. Yeah. W- when I first read the play, it deals with the theme of suicide. Frank is considering becoming just another anonymous mouse suicide st- statistic. Um, I was very aware. I don't... W- it's, it is a black comedy. It, it, um, our, our first review from London Pub Theatres is, is lovely. It, it says it's uh, 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 blackly... I've, I've, you know, I've written it down somewhere. In a, in a, in a, in a quote it, it was. It was part of the press release as well, wasn't it? Because I remember yeah. seeing that. Yeah. It, it, said, you know, it is a blackly comic and plainly clever ap- approach to a subject that we should all be talking about. And it, it's a very sensitive subject. I'm not making light of the subject at all. No. Um, this with Frank. Frank. Um, Frank's a, a performer, so as I was saying, Frank can articulate himself better when he's actually doing his stand-up comedy routine. Yeah. Uh, problem: Frank is now in his late forties. He's he's fallen on hard times. The bailiff have repossessed almost everything he owns. He's facing eviction. Um, he's one of his rela- his relationship has broken down. So Frank's very isolated. He's very feeling very vulnerable. Um, just because he's sort of entering middle age, he's, he's, he's finding himself a little bit ostracised. He's not, he trips over, he doesn't know who, all these new acronyms of turf and whatever else, and that, that confuses and frightens Frank. And Frank doesn't want, he, he's got to a point where he's frightened of opening his mouth, of offending someone, saying the wrong thing unintentionally. And it's actually, so Frank is really considering doing this. And before he does his final act, he, he realises he's, he's got one or two things that he really has to get off his chest. And he thinks, sod it, you know, might as well let rip now. And if I upset people, so be it. I, I don't mean to be. And I, like, his... I like Frank. I'm just saying from that, from that readout, I like Frank and I can relate to Frank quite a lot. Yeah. And right, and 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 he, you know, he's in, the part of the tagline. You know, he is. He's intelligent. He's funny, but but he's frustrated, and all of a sudden, he's just frank in the way he speaks, um, and uh, he he opens up spontaneously, and ha- as he starts talking, he he, like, he inadvertently counsels himself. He realizes he has to be brutally honest, and he can pinpoint bits in his life that you know maybe if he was to make changes and adapt and whatever else. There may be, a, you know, he can go forward or whatever, um, and so it's it's very much yes, it, you know, there is a thing out there. It's okay to talk. There's uh, I've been following on Twitter, um, sort of a grassroots um, sort of organisation or whatever. It's called Andy's Man Club. There's about twenty two. I know they're, they're spreading around the country, and it seems to be just for blokes to get together, have a cup of tea, and actually have a chat and talk about emotions. And that's another thing, really, with Frank. He's Frank's of a generation that he was brought up to, actually, you don't talk about your emotions. So culturally, there's a lot of people of our generation that are like that. Because we were, weren't we? We were of that generation where, uh, you know, the parents went, right, you know, sit down, shut up. If you've got a problem, deal with it, blah, blah, blah. And certainly oh, as, as a oh, male, my- we, you know, we didn't talk about stuff too much. My grandmother, God bless her, I mean, she she... Was in London during the Blitz. My mother grew up, was born during the Blitz in London, and so of course I remember as a kid falling over, and they, to me it was a big gaping wound in my knee. And of course, you know, I'm an actor; I dramatise things. <laughs> uh, <Yep. laughs> uh, and of course, my nan she'd go, "That that's a scratch." Literally, say so usually we lived through the war. There was bigger things than that. And in comparison, absolutely, she was right. And, you know, there were different days. And so you, I guess you just got on, you did just get on with things. Yeah, you did. I remember my uh, my school days were, were, you know, not the best school day. People say, oh, school, best day, best years of your life, you'll miss them. No, not for me. I was very happy to leave. But uh, I once got chased home by a bunch of thugs. And then I ran through a building site. And I invented free running. I, liked, I, I do like to uh, think that right. I invented that. It was me. 
<laughs> and and I got home all muddy, and my my dad went, "Wait on, you got mud in your pants," and battered me. So it's like that was kind of a crap day. <laughs> it's like I survived right. a beating to get another one, but you know, <laughs> we, no, no, we just we just dealt horrible. with it. <laughs> and all your feet hurting as well, and jumping over, doing fantastic stunts, and to oh. get home a beating. I was climbing up scaffolding, running along planks. It was a, nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody saw it, of course, but I, I was there. I knew, I knew it happened, and uh, yeah, it's st- still got slap. So it's definitely, uh, it's a very different generation nowadays, I think, isn't it? Uh, so. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, about in some ways, good, but in some ways, I do miss things from years ago. So it's, I'm kind of in the middle on the, on the pair of them. Mm. So you've done theatre for a while. How? Has, if at all, how has the theatrical audience changed or the theatrical business changed? Is it better? Is it worse? Or has it just changed? Uh, I don't know. I think it just keeps evolving. That's the best thing about theatre is live. Yeah. Um, and that's the best thing about this production of Human Issue because it's it's very hard to pinpoint it. It's I think Dean is, is uh, when I first wrote you, know, I, I learned a new word, it's metatheatrical theatre. I had to look it up. It's uh, a play within a play. Okay. I didn't know that word either. I'm glad you, you saved me the explanation because I would have had to look that up as well, to be honest. Good on you. They're very interesting. And obviously, then goes back to all the different offshoots of different styles of theatre, um, which is great. So, I get, yeah, yeah, every single night it could be done in a different style. Um, he's a he's a stand up comedian. He's he's you know he's he's probably knocking on fifty Frank. So he's been in the stand up circuit since the eighties when it was sort of the new rock and roll. Yeah, when you could say anything. Now you can't so much say anything. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's a part in the, in in this play where he helped. Yeah, I mean, you know, Frank's a contrarian, and so he he explains that in his comedy act, he introduces uh, ironic, um, politically incorrect humour into his act just to get a reaction. Um, and it does. He gets uh, denounced by an online hate campaign, and unfortunately, then he's getting work. So, I'm look. I think I I like Frank. I'm looking forward to meeting Frank at some point. Yes, yeah, please, yeah, yeah, definitely. He's, um, yeah, he's just very, he, he's very subtly written. He, he's uh, Dean's fantastic. Dean, uh, Dean's got a novel, uh, Finally Woken, mm. and in that he's created an antihero. It's uh, you know after reading it, I'm going, wow, I shouldn't like the the protagonist Max, but I I, I, I empathize, I have empathy for him. So he's very good. Mean- I, think, I mean, anti-heroes, I think, have been around for a long time, but I think more and more we we don't realise that we're liking anti-heroes. I sat down the other weekend and watched the entire new season of Top Boy, which just dropped onto Netflix, and I've, you know, I've seen all the previous episodes, and I love it. And then you sit down and you think about it, you go, actually, I shouldn't like that guy. He's a drug dealer. But but kind of yeah. in in this world, he's the guy I like, and everybody who's trying to get him, I don't want them to get him, but why do I like him? It's Why do I like anti-heroes? Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like, the the review we got when we we first did it. Was, it was like Frank points out the deepest and greatest flaws in humanity, yet um, also asks the audience to sympathise with him and consequently admit that we too are guilty of these things. Yeah. And this is a one man show. This is a, a one Mark Savage on stage show as well. So- yeah, it, it, um, I'm not totally up my own backside. Um, just wanted to just sort of produce, uh, just make theatre. Um, and so all the risk is on me. Yeah, there's a risk, of course there is. And so the risk is really, I guess, just on myself. Um, Dean's the writer, so it's a great script. I'm, you know, that's, that's a backup for me. Mm. Um, directing it, he's great at directing. So, um, yeah, and just sort of get out there and see. It's, it's um, you know, we're doing Clapham Fringe um, at the Bread and Roses Theatre. Um, they're great, so you know it's um, yeah. All need to do there is sell tickets. And I know I'd put the link to the tickets on the bottom of the press release, so you know anybody who's listening to this before October the sixth, you can click on that and it will take you to the ticket site and whatnot. But uh, it was, it's I, I love seeing different things. Something because they always said every story's been told, and maybe to a certain extent they have been, but there's always something new. I think that you can put into a story. And I think Human Issue definitely looks like one of them, which is good. So it's, for me, I, I watch hundreds of films a year, hundreds of damn things. I need to start going to theatre more. That much I do know, because there's 
theatres within like 10, 15 minutes of where I am, so I have no excuse whatsoever. <laughs> so when, when I see sort of things like Human Issue or your Savage Theatre Company, etc., I go, oh, yeah, I need to go to theatre more. So it's, it's a nice kick up my butt to remind me to do something that I really want to do anyway. So thank Excellent. you, thank you for that. <laughs> no, thank you. So it was. Uh, so what's your routine? So sixth of October, you're going to be doing your show. You're going to wake up in the morning. What, what are you? What is your general routine before a show, or do you not necessarily have one? Uh, we've got our um, tech rehearsal um, that afternoon. So we uh, got tech at the Bread and Roses Theatre, so we, we'll be over there in the afternoon. Um, then, yeah, kind of get prepare yourself, really. And, and I, don't, I don't sort of have any kind of rituals or whatever or, or anything else. Um, no, just go. It, it's, uh, I suppose just have a yeah, Of course, you, you just want to get out there and do it, really, and you, you're really prepared by that time. And then after it, after the 60 minutes, do you just sort of get off, breathe a sigh of relief for a nice cold drink of something or other? And then... I have a little mind after doing an hour on stage. I'm going to need to stretch us to Stuart. You will. Yeah, is Frank sitting down for some of this? Um, I'm hoping to, or is he going to be pacing up down the stage? Frank is very mobile and very animated. <laughs> he's, he's, got got a lot, he's got a lot to get off his chest. He's, he's, there's pent up. Um, but he's very cathartic for him. And, and the, the most important thing is, it, it underline, it's a story, it really is, it's a story of hope yeah. and, and, a tenacious, and a celebration of the tenacious nature of, of humanity. It, it, it really is a feel-good thing. It deals with a very uh, sensitive subject um, responsibly. It, it, you know, it's not taking a rise out of that issue whatsoever. It's actually, you know, just raising this, 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 quick, this, this issue of, you know, this is happening to our fellow human beings. And, and, you know, this is happening to men, to women, to, you know, I was reading that recently that there's a, a rise in, in young women under 25. So, you know, it's not, it just happens to be that this character happens to be Frank, who happens to have these characteristics. But we're talking about a topic that happens to our, all of our fellow human beings. And by the time that play is running, that will have happened to some people across the country, across the world, during that time as well. So it's not like it's it's something that happened or something that will happen. It's something that is currently it's going happening. On and on, yeah. And sadly, I was reading a, I, um, it's a, a, it's apparently the suicide is a 16-year high. And it's it's not like it's one of those things where you can go, oh, I know why that's happening. Let's sort that out. Let's fix it. Now, I don't, nobody really knows what's what's triggering it or causing it or something. It's I, no, I like solving puzzles, but that one I've never been able to to work out. You know, as and, many people, I guess. That's sort of the really the thing behind. Yeah, Frank hasn't got answers. So he's yeah. he's Frank realizes that actually by spontaneously being able to find his voice and. Just articulate really his, his thoughts, his feelings. He he goes deep. There's existential musings that, that Frank goes off, off on, and uh, but it's about finding a resolution. It's about for Frank. It's about acceptance, and also in general, it's about yeah, we need to talk about this issue, don't we? It's on the rise, and it's you know it affects an awful lot of people. I mean, you know the statistics for for, for every person that, that, that takes their, their life, it can affect between seven and fourteen people. And apparently, last year there there was just over six thousand. And I th- and it doesn't uh, differentiate whether you know what colour of hair you've got, what colour of skin you've got, whether you're a, a famous rock singer, whether you're a movie star, whether it, it has no. You know, I, th- I remember after when Robin Williams died, no, I mean, people were like, "Why?" And uh, they they sort of go, go a bit more in depth, sort of um, analysts uh, that, that they've got of it. But no, of course not. It, 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 it's across this. It's just it is a human issue, as, as this as the play rightfully sort of suggests. And I think also the, one of the many good things about the play is that when the audience leave, they will be having the conversation taking it out not just to the people in that they met in the audience but also to the friends and family oh where were you tonight oh, i went to watch human issue oh what was that then it was a play what was it about and it's it, so it is widening the conversation which is uh an added wonderful yes bonus, I think, I, I, isn't it? 
and hopefully breaking down some barriers of saying that this, you know, we, we can, it, it, there are still stigmas, taboos and whatever, so kind of surrounding it. Understandably, some people just, it's a hard thing for them to talk about. Um, and the previous productions we've done, yeah, there have been people to come up afterwards and just say, well, I could really identify with that through whatever reasons. They've, you know, experienced it, someone they know has experienced it. So, yeah, everyone knows of someone that this is affecting and, um, and just, you know, we talk about our physical health with no problems. Yeah. Especially us as blokes. I mean, you know, oh, I've got a football injury and this injury and that injury, and it can be sometimes a bit of a, wow, he's, you know, who's got the most injuries yeah. physically? And that's still a, a vulnerability. And yet we still, oh, I do, still find it hard to accept our mental health. Just, you know, our mental well-being, our mental, our mental balance. And it's like we could be in the worst place ever and somebody will come up and say, how are you? And you'll go, I'm all right. Or, I'm fine. And then that's it. We, we, I'm guilty of that constantly. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, yeah I'm fine. Okay. It's, and also it's a natural reaction, isn't it? A natural response. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I, go and see your doctor. You know, hello, how are you? You know, we, fine, thank you, doctor. Well, actually, I'm not because I'm here. Yep. Uh, and they go, that, what's wrong with you? Like, I don't know. You tell me. You're the doctor. I got a clue. Fix me. Yeah. I, feel, I don't feel well. It, it, it's just our, it is our natural response. It's also just in general sort of um, been reading diff, different reports. They're saying that, you know, people, uh, men born in the 1960s and 1970s are uh, uh, most at risk for, from death by suicide. Um, it, and back in the 1990s, when the, 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 our generation was in our 20s, it, it was the most, our generation was at most r- at risk then. So it's just something that's, you know, just kind of followed through for whatever reason. And that's the thing. I would love to know what that reason is. It's like, what is it so we can stop it? Oh, well, no, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, just reports are suggesting a lot of it is sort of, in a sense, cultural, that the men born in the 60s and 70s are known as Generation X. And they're saying that, um, as we were just talking about, it, that cultural upbringing the father and that stiff upper lip and you'd show you're tough and it, it was it was a different time yes our schooling was very actually the people going to school now are, are um we had our education knocked into us we did and I yeah think that was kind of the attitude wasn't it it was um i remember you know kids at school if a kid at school was to hit another pupil they would then be given the cane, violence would be inflicted upon them to make a point that violence isn't the answer. <laughs> isn't it? Yep. Controlling them with violence. Yes. Well, Frank would love this one. Frank now would actually go on a, a muse and a, a lovely rant about that completely. I'll have to talk to Dean about this and get and, him right. And it's, it is spot on, isn't it? It's like, why did you hit that child? Come to my office, I'm going to lash your hands with a plastic 30 centimetre ruler. Don't yeah. do it again. You've just done it. That's different. <laughs> it's like what? Yeah. And then just it adds to the surely that adds to cycle of violence, doesn't it? it it's it, it, you know it's a perpetuation. I think it does. But there anybody who wants to know what it was like going to school when we went to school, just go back and watch those early seasons of Grange Hill, and that's pretty much you know it's, that's the average version of it. I'm sure there's some things he probably couldn't have shown back then, but I think Grange Hill pretty much showed most of it. Yeah, they they, did. It was yeah, very they, accurate. Very hard hitting storylines uh, back then, yeah, of course. No, they were, yeah, very much so. Yeah, no, it was, it was fantastic. I'm very proud of that work. It was, uh, it was, it was of its time. It was great. It was, and I think now you've got, I don't know if you've got any equivalents now. I mean, you've got Ackley Bridge, which is, you know, as, as the majority of that's about the teachers and the, the parents and stuff, but you're Waterloo Road, which is another Phil Redmond show. But again, it's, I don't know, it's. it's a Phil Redmond show. I believe it was, yeah. Okay. I thought, right, hey, mate, he, he does fantastic stuff. He's, he's really got a great eye, isn't he? That's all ten seasons of that I've dropped onto BBC iPlayer, apparently. But of course, to be, so, you've got to remember, yes. this, this, this is going to turn into a podcast, the two grand, two grand the <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that, that is good, but at least we've got like, the sort of the north and the south. That, that's great. You know. We have. <laughs> well, this country, we're coming together over something, even it is having a good old gripe about the good old days. Well, I'm from Scotland originally. That's why my accent is a bit weird. So it's it's like a mixture of Scottish and English. My uh, my thing. So, but yeah, I'm from Scotland. Live near Manchester now. So and then you've you've got the South covered. 
so it's fine. Oh, good, yeah. It's, um... But it was, yeah. So definitely, I'm looking forward to just working my way through the entire run of Grange Hill. So, of course, our viewing times. There was only three channels. There was, yeah. Until 1982, I think, when Channel 4 came out. But, yeah. you know, now there's 24-hour TV and whatever else. The TV used to go off at, what, 10, 12 o'clock at night, I think? Or... It did. You get, like, the Royal Anthem or whatever it was, and then, yeah. bang, it would it would go on, and a high-pitched tone would wake you up, yeah. and you'd have to switch it off. And we was, we, you know, we didn't really have that much choice, as in we had three choices of, of, of TV channels. Now we can we can watch whatever we want. See, you know, this, is, this is where I think the human race is going wrong. I blame I'm going to I'm going to say Netflix, but I mean digital sc- streaming in general. But Netflix and touch screens, I think, is is what's going wrong because it's like now if you want to watch, uh, be it like the only way is Essex. If you choose to watch twenty years of that or whatever it is, you can go on and you can watch it all. You're not going to accidentally see a documentary about politics or a documentary about poverty. And learn something. You don't like we did. We would go. Oh, no, it's telly. What's on? Well, oh, no, sure, oh yeah. I'll watch this. But Stuart, Stuart, uh, Stuart, I'm an actor. There's no way that I'm going to say anything bad about Netflix because they no, employ. Oh, dear. <laughs> they do, and I love Netflix. I've got them. I discovered a new one called Shudder, which is all horror films and indie films. I'm glued to that one at the minute, but it's. I think just generally, I think the audience, the people that watch Netflix and Amazon and all other streaming platforms, watch something different now and again. Just You'll discover gold on there. You really will. Sure. No, I, no, I understand what you mean. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing now, though, two ways. I understand. I mean, there is just such a, a wide, varied, different platforms now to, to make a film and get it out there. Yeah. But also, as well, there's the commercial side of it. Yes, there is, yeah. How can you make money? And, and you know, even in doing theatre or whatever else, yeah, how, you know, theatre, you're not going to, you know, you're not in, you're going to make money, but it'd be great to, I'm self-funding at the moment, so it'd be great to, you know, in future, get some funding and whatever else and just, you know, just study it pays people a wage, creates work within an industry sort of thing. It's a business. I mean, I've been a supporter of British films oh, it's all my life because I've watched them, but n- not so much as I have in the past like nine years, I think, now. So it's pretty much any British film that comes out, bang, I'll pick it up on DVD, I'll speak to the people that are in it, I'll help publicize it and tweet it and stuff like that. And, you know, Dangerous Mind of a Hooligan's been sat on my DVD shelf for many years. You're in it. So there you go. So I watched that when it came out. So it's that's, I will, I love them. And, um... There's a great, that great Greg Hall film. Uh, Greg has got um, a lovely little short out at the moment called Smack Ed, okay. being written with, with George Rosso. I've just written that down. I'll go looking for Greg's film. But uh, yep, he did yeah. he did Hooligan. So it's... And I saw a fantastic short film recently. Um, it's called Three Sacks Full of Hats. <laughs> okay. Uh, off the top of my head, Alison Stedman is in it. Um, Debbie Anna's alone, I think. Excuse me if I've mispronounced your name. Um, directed it, um, blew me away. Fantastic. I know that it's. I think. I think the next festival it's doing is at Bolton, uh, early next month. I shall tweet you. There is, yeah, there is a Bolton Film Festival coming up because I've seen some stuff on my Facebook about that. So yeah, but I saw Three Sacks Full of Hats is a film. It blew me away. It just, the, the, just the whole nineteen-minute film and the, the story. Um, you, you know, it's just, yeah, I really recommend people to see it. So this needs to go on the new short film streaming platform, whatever that's going to be. They all need to go on there and we can just sit and watch it all Right. We need, to go, we need to have a chat, Stuart, and then we'll go on to Dragon's Den. Yes, we will do. We'll go, right, it's, it's kind of like Netflix, but it's called Short Flicks. <laughs> and all of these like, short films could go on it. And lots like of filmmakers that. would be really yeah, happy because the films could go on it. Our idea, Stuart. They will, but I'll make sure I get this podcast out super fast and we've copyrighted it. It's done its hours. Yeah. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> so what are you up to for the rest of your day? Are you going to sort of uh, investigate Frank some more? Are you going to sit down and go, wow, I survived my first podcast? Or how many questions did he fire at me? My God. No, it's been a, do you know, I've actually <laughs> forgotten that this is going to go out. Like, do you know, that's, it's, it is, I guess it, it's, it's, uh, it's a form of social anxiety. We're all sort of, all, I'll listen back to this and I'll be very judgmental. I don't, I'll watch my work once and then I'll put it away. I, 
one of my favourite films is Sunset Boulevard. And I love watching that because that's a reminder that actually don't get caught up in me being an audience of my own work. Once I do, <laughs> no, you know, I don't want to become Norma Desmond, bless her. And so, you know, once you do work, you, you, you're, you're handing it out there. For, and it's lovely. It's, you know, it really is such a, a, an honour and very warming that work I did nearly 40 years ago is now being re-released on DVD. And there's other genera you know, as you said, you know, it's different generations of people that probably weren't born and, and, and are watching that. That's, that's, a real, that's amazing. That's a real testament to that, that, the, the whole production. The, you know, I, had a, I was a very, very small cog in a very big... Uh, wheel and it was fan you know I learned an awful lot about filming it was you know the, the storylines that my character had were script edited by Anthony Mengele I mean yeah. you know he went on to be an Oscar winner he did and, yeah you know, that's that's well uh, wow. you know people would pay an awful lot of money to to, to sort of work around that man and, and to pick up some, some fantastic tips, great tips I picked up, you know, and, and for, you know, everyone on there, the adult actors, they were fantastic. I learned so much. It yeah, was I remember what... I remember watching a few years ago one of the episodes and Anthony Miguel's name was on it as like script editor or whatever it was, and I'm thinking, no, that can't be, and it, yep, it is. It was, yes, it was, you know, when when um, he won the Oscar for English Patient and then obviously people were looking at his, his previous work and whatever, and that's when the, the Grain Chills I did seemed to become a bit kind of sexy and cool. I think Grain Chill was always sexy and cool, though, to be fair. But no, I know what you mean. <laughs> right, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, no, so that was, you know, and, and listen, without it, I wouldn't sort of, get that foot in the door that nice it's a nice little springboard i wouldn't be doing this podcast now and being able to tell people about the plague human issue and and hopefully and this is really frank is of that generation he's of gripper's generation um so and he really is kind of an every kind every every kind of man people of that generation men of that generation are going to totally identify with frank um the partners will go yeah that's you um <laughs> They'd be like, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. Yeah, and and even uh, kind of adolescent children who will be, uh, you know, the the teenagers, early twenties, yeah, do come along. It is actually a family show, but for older families, not not young children. But you know, for grow you, you grown up children, and, and you're you're a middle aged bloke, and that go along and actually watch that, and it's probably how we all, we 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 we're being seen by all our loved ones. I know. I'm sure there will be some people in the audience who are watching Frank going, hang on, that is me. I didn't realise it was me, that is. And they maybe um, get some help or whatever. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of, I'm finding Frank, he's he's, he's great, he's cathartic, he's he's a bit like therapy for me, really. (laughs) (laughs) A 60-minute therapy session in front of an audience. That's got to be kind of scary, though. But (laughs) (laughs) Not for the audience, it's right, I'm not that bad. I mean... (laughs) No, it's great. It, it, it's so well written. It, it flows beautifully. It's. Uh, I was talking to Dean yesterday when, when we were rehearsing, and uh, I came up with a really flowery, uh, pretentious analogy. Um, I just said, it made me realise that as an actor, you, we, I'm sort of like, I suppose, a pianist. And it all depends on what piano I'm given and on how it will play. In other words, as an actor, I'm reliant on the script. You know, I, it, it, it's got to be written well, and, and the character has got to be able. I mean, with Frank, as soon as I read it, I, I was more or less able to step into Frank, and that's just because Frank is—he's he, he, kind of adaptable. Any actor that, that plays Frank will be able to adapt to them to just, you know, their understanding. Now, would you be okay watching another actor play Frank, or would you feel a bit like the, the character Frank was cheating on you, going? That's kind of my character. <laughs> it's, he's mine. I want to keep him. I know him. The play is about it, it's about the text. It's a, it's the script. It is not about the actor. That 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 is you know just kind of secondary. So it's uh, like you, you're the, you're the instrument that's playing Frank's tune to a certain extent. Is that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Yes, I I yeah. would love to tour this. I've been um, sort of having conversations and whatever. Um, I understand that it would be a lot better if uh, Human Issue was, it would get a better audience. I went to Liverpool, and I, I thank you for people up there, love, love Scousers, I really do, and they were really lovely. And just one of them said, Mark, 
a Londoner, comedian in Liverpool. Everyone knows that we're the funniest. Uh, oops. <laughs> no, no, that's cool. No, I go okay. with that. No, what I'm saying is, as well, yeah, it, 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 it's kind of a thing that around different parts of the country have a local actor performing it because it, 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 yeah. it, it, everybody, you know, it just makes it more more real, I guess. It makes it more relatable. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's much more relatable, yeah. And then for for everybody up the north of the country, it keeps us out southerners where you like us. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> While we're all sort of panicking, <laughs> panicking about Thomas Cook and leaving Europe and stuff like that. So, you know what? I, I, all this week, I am so I am obsessing over, over this script and and push, you know. The, retweeting and whatever else and so I, I've missed out on the news and I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm, as Frank would say I'm, I'm blissfully ignorant this week and it's I'm not so stressed out no unless you've got a, a holiday book with Thomas Cook like I have on the uh, on the 9th of October then you've nothing to worry about because but you know they may go into solvency today so oh, yeah. who knows but uh, you know yes yeah, so I think that's pretty much what the internet's full of at the minute it's Thomas Cook chat and uh, people just having a whinge about Trump and Boris Johnson as usual ah, all right. So you've not missed too much. <laughs> right. Okay, good. Right. That's not good. Well, I'm going to let you go for now, Mark, but it's, I'm glad you've not been nervous. I, I was more nervous than you, I'm willing to bet, because I'm like, oh, my God, Mark Savage is going to call me. I'm going to have a conversation with him. So <laughs> I, I genuinely – I get more nervous afterwards. Afterwards, I'm like, oh, God, I've just had, like, a really cool chat with Mark Savage. So I, I contain them while I'm chatting and then, and then get nervous afterwards. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Andrew, thank you very much. And thank you very much for all your support on social media and everything you do. I really appreciate it. And, you really, you know, you, you do well for British film and sort of, you know, British sort of entertainment in general. So, so I guess from all of us, thank you. Well, it's like my ultimate reward for being a film geek. It's great because, uh, you know, we come from a generation where you could never speak to somebody that was on TV or a film. It just never happened. And now we can do it at the touch of a keyboard. It's amazing. So uh, you know, I genuinely enjoy doing it. And I also know it helps. So it's like a, a sure. one and, deal. And then, uh, hopefully that takes it away. At the end of the day, it, it, it's a job, isn't it? And, and really, I, as an actor, I, I'm only as good as the, the character that I'm kind of doing at the moment. Yeah. You know, so no, I'm not, you know, yeah, you're joking. Man. I've got to go and do clean out cat litter trays and everything else. <laughs> it's, it's, exactly. It's like we, we should have oh, butlers sure. to do this, shouldn't we? Oh, oh, Stuart, that's exactly it, yeah. The Rolls Royce is out the front and whatever else. In reality, I'm cleaning out litter tray on a Sunday afternoon while just, with a script in my hand. Just get an intern. Just say, look, your job, I might show you a script one day, but for now, just clean that cat box out. <laughs> it's <laughs> like the wax on, wax off karate kid thing. There's, there's a meaning. You just don't need to know the meaning yet. Just clean the cat box out. It will teach you a vital lesson in theatre. That's a point, <laughs> won't it? But no, it's been an absolute pleasure. I wish you all the very best. I wish, uh, wish Dean all the very best. And I wish Frank all the very best as well. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. You are welcome. Take care, Mark, and we'll speak to you again, and speak to you again soon. All right, thanks, Stuart. Okay. Take care. Bye. <laughs>